Okay, here I go again. Good afternoon. I'm Rose October. Thank you for joining us on Arts, Culture, and Things in Between. This afternoon, like the others that you have witnessed, would be a little different because of who my guest is today. But I'll get to that later on. Let me tell you a little bit of arts, culture, and things in between, and give a special welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time. For the ones coming back, those of you, thank you. So Arts, Culture, and Things in Between is a program that features individuals who are gatekeepers of our arts and culture. They're not only performing artists, but also teachers, advocates, and scholars who focus on the preservation of the arts and culture. When arts is mentioned, it is being referred to as different art forms like visual, applied, or performing arts. Examples of visual arts would be painting, sculpting, photography, film. Examples of applied arts would be architecture as in designing and or building or constructing a project. Under applied arts, you can find fashion designing, jewelry designing, furniture designing. Some examples of uh, what the, the work that the fashion designer would do would include working with different types of patterns and fabrics. For a jewelry designer, that person would be working with different types of materials, such as wood, plastic, metal, silver, gold, and various types of stones. For the furniture designer, that person may be working with different types of woods and look at the ways that the woods are laid and cut, designed. Then there is performing arts. Example of performing arts could be music, another one, photography, how about theater, opera, drama, singing, stand-up comedy, and the one that brings a big smile to my face, you guys know what it is, dance. When culture is mentioned, culture is the middle part of the name of the program. Arts, culture, it generally means the way of life for a particular group of people. So for this program, it is inclusive to me the various groups of individuals that embrace ways of life. In other words, looking at attitudes and behaviors. What is important to note though, is that as culture is mentioned, I'm really looking at how practices are passed from one generation to another. Things in between, the last part of the name of the program, arts, culture, and things in between. These refer to the issues that affect the execution of the arts and cultural practices. This involves both positive and negative experiences that become part of the creative process. Today's guest is a performing artist, but before we meet him, let me read the bio. Anselm Douglas is a Trinidadian Canadian singer, songwriter, and author who was born and raised in the small village, La Romaine, in southern Trinidad. His primary education was received at San Fernando Boys Roman Catholic School, and he attended St. Benedict's College for his high school education. Upon completion of high school, he attended an apprenticeship program in welding for 14 months. His first employment experience was at a hotel owned by his uncle, where he functioned in the position as the manager of the night shift. Anselm's exposure to music began at four years old through his grandfather who hosted engagements for the community under his house. This led to the recognition that the village needed a community center, which was eventually built. Anselm's musical journey was nurtured through attending folk music performances at the community center. In addition, 
his admiration for his older sister, who was a young, talented, and ambitious poet, served as his role model and inspired him to develop his natural musical talent. Anselm's vocal talent was molded while singing at his local Pentecostal church in Trinidad. At 16, he got together with a few friends in the church and formed a band called Exodus. This band quickly became very popular and not only gave Anselm his initial taste of the spotlight, but also revealed his stardom qualities. In 1984, Anselm enlisted in the Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard for six years. During this time, he continued to hone his musical skills while performing with a Coast Guard band. He performed various genres of music due to his appreciation of diverse music influencers, such as the local greats like Blakey and the Lord Kitchener and international superstars like Peebo Bryson and James Ingram. In 1986, still serving in the Coast Guard, Anselm's interest turned to Trinidad and Tobago soca and calypso music. A couple of years later, he was an established and recognizable artist of exceptional talent. He performed with renowned big bands in Trinidad like Fireflight and Atlantic, where large audiences enjoyed his unique husky yet sultry sound. During this time, he delivered some mega hits like Raga Pum Pum, Good Music to Dance, and his international acclaimed hit, Doggy, Who Let the Dogs Out, which went on to win a Grammy and is arguably one of the most popular songs ever written and recorded. In 1994, Anselm migrated from Trinidad to Canada. Anselm has written and recorded hundreds of song along, songs along with recording three R&B albums. His diversity as a singer in embracing various mu musical genres has taken his fans through a gamut of human experiences as noted by two of his singles entitled Friend and Ooh Ah off of the Soul Island album, which is a smooth jazz album. In 2013, Anselm Rissi released a power soca song, Bacchanal, along with the neo Calypso song, Dancing With You, as well as recording I Want To Know. In 2014, Boom and Brought Up Sea and a smooth reggae track, It Wasn't You, were released. In 2018, he recorded the song, I Read Tonight. In 2019, he released Make It Clap and wrote Back It Up and Break That Cycle. Break That Cycle is a song that was written to lend his voice to the global movement about abuse. Through his music, he joined the masses in heightening awareness of the importance of breaking the cycle of abuse. The song Abuse featured on his Sir Anselm Douglas album is one that speaks of this social outrage. As a performing artist, domestic violence is his platform. Anselm is an author. In 2019, he published and released his first children's book, The Adventures of Spin and Scratch, The Relocation. He has just completed the unpublished sequel to Spin and Scratch, The Cat's Trophical Fee. Anselm has been recognized for his work in the music industry. His accolades man a 2001 Grammy Award for Doggy, Who Let the Dogs Out, in the category of the best dance track, and the 2014 Black Canadian Awards for being the best Caribbean style artist. These accolades received are evidence of his indelible mark in the musical business. His intensity and passion for his craft continues to continue to flourish, and he showcases his God-given talents to audiences worldwide. Music has always been at the core of his being. Currently, he is working on the new smooth jazz soul album. My friends, before 
we meet today's guest, singer, songwriter, and author. Let's take a let's take a peek of a brief slideshow, very brief, and then we'll speak with Anslam. Step behind and you're down, you're down. You've got to be where that's all like. I said brief, right? I did. So, Anslem, welcome to Arts, Culture, and Things in Between. Hi, good afternoon. Good evening, good afternoon to you, wherever you might be in the world, because I know we're listening via the internet, so it might have some people in different time zones. So good evening, good afternoon, good night. And thank <laughs> you for having me on your show. It's been a pleasure. It's And it's been quite a while since I've seen you, but you yes. look well. Well, you got it. You know, that's COVID. <laughs> yeah, so true. Not, not, not the way that I look, but the fact that we haven't seen each other in such a long time. We've got to bring that, that COVID, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Good <laughs> excuse. We can blame it on COVID. Well, I'm so glad that you're here. You you were able to join us today, and um, it is all mine, man. Yeah, I hope I hope you're as excited as I am. I I noticed that every Sunday I get more excited than before. I don't know if it's because I'm living a boring life during the week or what, but this well, I, I am excited to see who is the guest next week. Who's going to get you more excited than I am? <laughs> <laughs> that I love that so I went through your impressive bio and I was thinking as a boy what did you want to become as you grew up could you remember yeah um you know I think I'm one of the fortunate people who kind of knew what I knew what I wanted to be from a child I kid you not um okay. I remember as a little boy you know growing up in La Romaine, you know my sisters and I, we would, there was a show on, on, on the radio, but not a lot of people had televisions back then, you know, and being a little village boy, there was a show on the radio on a Sunday evening called the Dave Elcock Hit Parade, you know, and yeah, I would, you know, we would all put on socks because we had wooden polished floor in the living room and we would put on socks and pretend to be Michael Jackson or James Brown or whoever, whoever is the big star at that time, you know, because every Sunday evening, uh, Dave Elkock would have the hit parade, the top 10 songs of the week. And, you know, quietly inside, I knew I want to do this. And I remember sometimes, you know, when carnival time comes around in Trinidad, because at, in those days, that's the only time you would hear Calypso on the radio, right? Because right after, right after carnival, we go into the Lenten period. Mm -hmm. But I remember singing and, and asking my mom, Mommy, it's just something like Sparrow. It's just something like Sparrow. She said, boy, baby, it's something. <laughs> you know? But I, in my head, I used to think I'm something like Sparrow. I'm something like Kitchener or Blakey or, or, or you're the greats at that time. So you try to mimic them. But to answer your question, I think from that tender age, I knew that I really wanted to be on stage and be an entertainer. You know? Wow. And look at you. Many moons you know, later. Days, in those days, you can't go and tell your mom or your dad, I want to be a singer. I mean, you want to be dead. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You want to be a singer? Are you crazy? Caribbean parents, Caribbean no. parents don't want to hear that. You know, to make your parents proud, you got to say, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. Do I ever yeah. come and say you want to be a singer? No. Yeah. Or a dancer or, or anything in the arts. You know, that, that is just something you do as a hobby. Nobody saw that as, as a career. You know, that, Isn't that something? Thinkable and unheard of. Yeah. You know? Wow. <laughs> I kind of always knew. I always knew. Yeah. So who was the person taking you to church as a boy? Because you had your beginnings in the church. Yeah, I, I started, to, you know, from, from a little, little boy, I remember we had to go to Sunday school, you know. Um, there was no if, but, so maybe. You had to go to Sunday school, you know. And um, my aunt, who lived right next door to us, you know, she was Pentecostal and, you know, I would go to Sunday school with her kids who were slightly older than I was, 
but we go to Sunday school on a Sunday evening. So that that was the beginning of it, you know. And sometimes you want to go to what we call matinee um, on a Sunday evening as kids, you know. So you, you can't have one without the other. If you want to go to matinee, and that is not every Sunday, trust me. The matinee thing is not an every Sunday thing. <laughs> but if you want to go to matinee, you've got to be going to Sunday school. <laughs> They gotta go to Sunday school, you know. So that was that was just my yeah. my start in church and all of that. Yeah. But I I in Sunday school were you singing though? Oh no no no! I was I was just like probably seven or eight at that time. Mm -hmm. And then when when uh when when the summertime well back then we didn't call it summertime we call it um August holidays. Yes. When that time came around, they would have events in the Pentecostal church for kids. So every day you kind of go to church like a kind of kids crusade. Mm -hmm. You know, so you spend, you spend almost every day in the week going to this thing. It was fun. You know, you started singing and it had games and it had all that stuff to keep children busy. And But let me ask you, let me ask you this funny question. Were you able to ever try out, were you brave enough to try out some of your James Bond moves that you were trying out at home there at the church? Kidding? Yeah. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 In no. fact, um, I kind of knew that I could sing, but you never had the opportunity to do it in front of an audience, but you always kind of knew. And then, you, you know, you would hear your cousin saying, eh, well, you could sing, man. Yeah, you could sing a little bit, man. So, you know, your, your confidence started to grow, but you never had the opportunity to stand in front of an audience and do a performance per se, you know. Mm -hmm. So your your older sister, mm -hmm. she is she's a poet. I'm thinking, I'm thinking once a poet, always a poet. That's what I'm thinking. Uh -huh. But I'm looking at how she was your role model with whatever poetry she was writing at the time. I and think you were watching and learning. I think I think among siblings there's always this quiet kind of rivalry, this competition going on. Mm -hmm. And um if I'm not mistaken, both of them used to write poems and, and I have two sisters who are older than I am. And okay. I would, you know, I would try my hand at it, at writing a little poem here and there, but they were the ones who were really good at it, you know, but I, I kind of stuck to it, you know, everybody went on to be the doctor and the, okay. <laughs> and the, and the stuff that was expected, you know, you expect, uh -huh. okay, well, they went on to be that. I... Uh -huh. I stuck to the arts and here I am. So it's, it's, it would be okay to say that they influenced your writing skills on some level and your involvement yeah. in safely, the arts. Safely, safely. It's safe yeah. to say that, you know. Have um, you told them that? Do they know? No, I'm not going to get their head swollen. No, I'm not going to tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a secret i'm taking to my grave <laughs> well i hope they're watching now and I, if they're not i hope they eventually get to hear you and tell you a few things about sibling rivalry on a yeah. different level <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned that at 16 years old you and friends started your own church band yes what I... propelled you all to do that okay hmm i when I, I started, like, as, as a young adult now, I'm a teenager, I'm, I'm actually a church member now. You know, before I was in Sunday school and you go, and, but then you, be, you, you, you got baptized and you become a church member and you're, you're there. And there's a choir in church. So, you know, there was a drama club that I was part of. There was a debate club. There was a public speaking club. There was always something for young people to do at the church. And there was a choir. So I... I jumped into the public speaking and the choir and public speaking, choir and drama. Wow. But choir was my thing. So there I am now in the choir and um, I'm singing and the choir, you know, while you're doing your parts, the choir director is coming around and listening and making sure that you, you're sticking to your harmonies and, and all that stuff. And before you know it, I started getting leads in the choir. You know, um, I, I wasn't trying to push myself up, but it, it was happening. You know, I started getting leads in the choir and then we did this massive cantata, you know, um, and the choir was growing in numbers. We, I think we were up to 50 something members in the choir now. 
And, um, you know, we did a Christmas morning cantata and we rehearsed for months because we were performing to song tracks. So, you know, you got to get this right because the song track don't, don't stop for you. You got to just, you know, so it was, it was such a challenge to be rehearsing and getting it tight and getting it right. And I had two major lead vocal roles in the cantata along with all the other um, supporting roles in it. And it was just an amazing thing. And right after that, we decided, you know what, me and two other guys, Teddy and, uh, and Barrett, we decided to create a little band. It was a trio. And before you know it, another person joined, and another person joined, and we end up being um, six of us. You know, everybody playing an instrument. I used to do, I used to be on drums and vocals. And, you know, sometimes we would switch, you know, we would have, the bass players started to play keyboards and the keyboard players started to play bass. And it was just a fun thing. And as young men, we were there and we were doing it. And, you know, the recognition started and, you know, young people from everywhere were coming to see this band because this band was so good and, you know, all that good stuff. Yeah. So you mentioned that you played the drum sometimes. Mm -hmm. When last have you played the drum? About a hundred years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'll leave that alone. I'll leave that alone. Along, along, yeah. along. You know, and they say if you don't use it, you lose it. So yes. I, I, I haven't played the drums in, I don't know how long. Yes, you know. yes. But I guess your thing, what you're saying, your thing was really singing. Singing, That's yes. Thing. Singing. So I just now, kept to that, you know. Now, right after high school, mm -hmm. you did an apprenticeship yeah. for 14 months in welding. Mm -hmm. How has that welding benefited you later on in life? You know, or the apprenticeship? Yeah, I'll tell you something. That gentleman, God rest his soul, he's passed now. But I think the men in my life, he's right up there with the, the, the male figures in my life who had the greatest positive influence on me. He's right up there, you know, because he... You know, coming out of high school, he, he taught you life. He taught you business. He taught you, you know, Mr. Hugh Atley, God rest his soul. He, he was just a person in, in that 14 months, I grew up. I grew up. And the thing about it is every day you're there and you're not getting paid. It's not about money. It's, it's you're learning. It's like a school, right? Mm -hmm. And at any given time, we would have 14, 15 young men there learning a trade and doing something with their lives because not as soon as you come out of school, you're going to get a job, you know, and, and, you know, back then the, the, the general consensus was you go to school to get a job. You know, now we understand that you go to school to get an education mm -hmm. because the drive then was your best go to school so you could get a job. You know, now we understand go to school is not about getting a job, it's getting an education. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. So yeah. when you come out of school, you better get a job right away. So I was I was not one to stand up on the corner and hang out and chill on the block. And that was never my, you know, I, I couldn't do it because my father was a police officer and he was a dread, dread man. He he didn't play, <laughs> you know. And my, my mom was a very serious woman too. So there was no standing on corners and hanging out. So yeah. It was right there and Mr. Hugh Atley just had this great impact and influence on my life and how I viewed life and how I approach stuff. And, and you know, he taught me about the importance of time, you know, being, being and, and, and good work ethics. And when you do a job, do it correctly, you know, because you always say, if you can't do it right the first time, when are you going to get a chance to fix it? So do it right the first time, time. you know, and that kind of stuff. It was just, it was just a positive influence on my life. Good. Good. I love it. I love it. But before we take another peek at who you are, uh, you mentioned dread and serious <laughs> to describe your parents. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure my friends watching, they're probably chuckling because AKA strict parents. Right. That's what you're talking about. Strict yeah, parents. And then in those days too, the village used to raise a child. So you can be doing anything crazy because people say, wait a minute. That's not, that's not so-and-so, and that's not so-and-so. So, -and -so. so mm -hmm. you, even if your parents are wrong, you still had to carry yourself in a manner that represented your family name and your household. You, yep. you had to represent. 
yep. you know? yeah. the village yeah. raising the child the african oh, yeah. yes oh, yeah. the village so let's take a quick peek at some more of you and then we'll come back and talk some more sounds good okay So for those of you joining us late, I'm Rose October on Arts, Culture, and Things in Between. And our guest today is Anselm Douglas, singer, songwriter, and author. And Anselm, mm -hmm. you yes, spent, you yes, spent <laughs> six years, <laughs> spent six years, six years as a course guard. Right, six mm -hmm. years, and you also because of the music in you, you they had a band that you joined. Now, was this yeah. band standing before you got there, or when you got there, the band was formed? We, me, and some members of my batch created this band. Okay, here you go again. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we had we had a drummer, we had, and uh, a couple other people from folks from outside of my batch, batch meaning the people that I trained with, uh -huh. you know, and we just pulled this band together, a little five-piece band, and I was a singer. We would rehearse and we started putting on little shows for, for Coast Guy, just for Coast Guy, just, just for a few fellas in the dormitory and in the mess hall. And it was fun. It was really, really good. Were you guys able to do work or you spend more time rehearsing? Oh, no, you, you got to do your work. You got to okay. do your work because this is, this is off the records, right? This is, this is not like an official, we are the official Coast Guy band. It wasn't like that. Okay. So in our spare time and sometimes after work, you know, when everybody's off, we put in a little hour, two hours practice and, you know, it was... But, but you, had to, you had to have the, the blessing of the seniors. They, 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 didn't mind. they, they, they re honestly they didn't mind. In fact, they kind of encouraged it because it was something positive uh -huh. and it's something that Coast Guard could be proud of. We have our own band. Mm -hmm. you know, and it, it was fun. You know, we knew that we weren't going to be um, hired by any big promoter <laughs> in, a, in a big fat. But oh, okay. okay. It was good. Yeah. So, so, you know, when I thought about asking you this question, I was wondering if you guys got privileges, but I guess, no, you guys were just humble servants. Just, just guys are doing a little thing and, and having fun, having fun doing it, you know? No. Were you writing music then? What kind of music were you singing then? Um... I was really just getting into soca music. Um, and I know when I, when, I, when I say things like this, people think, but you're from Trinidad. You're supposed to know soca. I knew soca music, and I enjoyed singing it as a calypso music as a child because I was following people like Blakey and, and Shadow. And, and wow, all the people I'm calling, they're deceased now. <laughs> you know, Blakey and Shadow and, and, and these people, mm -hmm. Lord Kitchener and these guys. But when, when the music became soca, I never had the opportunity to really perform it, mm -hmm. you know? So, and coming from a singing background, soca was more of an attack music. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was more attack, you know? I, I don't know if you understand what I mean by that, but... Well, I, later on, I was planning to ask you the difference between soca and calypso, but let's talk about the difference now so that folks can understand the differences. Um, to me... People have been trying for time and memorial to describe the difference. I, I just think the difference is Calypso was always more um, lyric driven and Soka is more rhythm driven. Mm -hmm. You know, Soka and Calypso, I, I have done Soka songs already where you could sing the second verse first and the first verse third because sometimes it doesn't really carry a storyline. And this is not true to all soca songs. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to Calypso, you can't go and sing a Calypso. Calypso has a beginning, middle, and an end. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm -hmm. storytelling. It's right. storytelling right. in song. Right. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't about so much dance, even though you could have danced to it and had a good time to it because it had that Calypso beat. Mm -hmm. You know, soca music, on the other hand, has this, this, this drive, this 
pelt our ways, get up and wine, you know, back and out. You know, so if you ask me to, to describe the difference, I, that's how I would describe it. One was okay. more rhythmic and one was just more lyric driven. Okay, all right. We'll come back to that later on, I'm sure. What happened when you left the Coast Guard? So I left the Coast Guard um, and uh, I will tell you, can I tell you why I left? Yes, if that's important. <laughs> Okay. I'm hoping that it's not a dishonorable discharge or anything like no, that. No, no, not at all, not at all. <laughs> Remember, Mr. Hewart, he taught me good work ethics, right? So um, <laughs> I was in the Coast Guard, and I started to record with a band called Fireflight. Because while, I'll let me give you a brief story. While I was in the Coast Guard, I met this girl, and the intention was to get married. But I had no money to get married. You know, so he, there she is, this girl I really, really like, I, I fell in love with, and I wanted to get married, but I had no money. So I said, you know what, I'm going to go on that talent show. There was a local talent show called Scouting for Talent. And, um, and I said, I'm going to, this is from early in the year, and I said, I'm going to go on that show, and I'm going to get money to get married. Somebody said, but suppose you don't make the finals. I said, hey, I'm going to make the finals. I'm going to get married. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so... Here I am now. I went and I auditioned, and I got in. I got into the, on the preliminary. Of course, you got to go through the preliminaries, right? And when I sang on the preliminary night, my first night, the person who was in charge of the music band on the show came to me and he said, as soon as this competition is over, you have a job with Fireflight. Fireflight was one of the bigger bands in Trinidad at that time. And Fireflight was responsible for doing the music for that talent show. So as soon as I sang, when I came off stage, the leader of the band, Mr. Carl Beaver Henderson, came to me and said, hey, as soon as this competition is over, you have a job with Firefly. So I knew I was, I, I, had a, I had a job, even though I have a job with the Coast Guard, right? So to make a long story short, I went through the whole thing and I think I came third or fourth in the finals. I wasn't about it. I was just about making enough money to get married. This, was, <laughs> this, was, this wasn't about me trying to win a competition. It was about getting money to get married. That's why I went in there. That's it. So I got my monies. I got married. And I'm still in the Coast Guard. And now I'm performing with one of the big bands out of Trinidad. But because I'm in the military... I'm not allowed to travel. Like, you can't just jump on a plane and say, you're going to London to do a show, or you're going to come to the U.S. to do a show. You can't do that. Not in the military, you know? So it's, I started to have this um, tug of war going on inside of me. It was just because I want to do music, but I have a family now, and I need to support them. I have a, I have a job, an income here. Music is, mm, you sure you want to do that, man? You sure you want to do that? You know, so there was this tug of war. But then just about that, we had an attempted coup in Trinidad back in 1990. So I was recording with the band, recording with the band. And then in 1990, we had an attempted coup. And during that time, I remember having on board the vessel that I was working on, I was um, like a heavy arms person, you know, you know, these big weapons with a long belt with all these rungs of ammunition. And I'm thinking, could be actually taking somebody's life tonight. That's what's going on in my head. I, I'm being honest with you. I, I don't think I've ever said this on an interview. I was thinking I could be, I could kill somebody tonight. I don't want to kill anybody. I, I, I know that it's a job and you, 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 you know, it, it's about country and it's, it's all that good stuff. And, but in my heart, I don't want to kill anybody, mm -hmm. you know? So, at that point, at that moment, I kind of made up my mind, maybe this is not for me. Even though I, I think I was a good sailor, I, I, I left the Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard as a qualified um, launch captain. I left with, you know, with my certificate in coastal navigation and marine firefighting and safety at sea and all these other stuff. I, you know, but I don't think I, the job might one day require me to kill someone. And I don't think I want to do that. You know, so I, 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 I went home, I spoke with my wife and I said, you know what? I think at the end of my six year contract, I want to call it off. And she said, 
Well, okay, if you want to do that, I'll support you, but let's remember that you have a family, right? I say, yeah, so we're doing this? You say, we're doing this, and we did it. And I never looked back. Wow. Never wow. Looked back. Wow. In your in your quiet times, do you sometimes reflect on your life um, as a Coast Guard personnel? Oh, yeah. Because, again, it was another six years of my life that I will never forget. It was just so, had such an, it was so impactful on my life, you know. Um, the people that you meet, I mean, I, I have friends who I've known for 36 years, you know. And, and it was just so impactful. And, and I, I've learned stuff that I will never forget, things that will carry me through for the rest of my life, you know, disciplines that will carry me through for the rest of my life. So I always sit back and look at it and say, wow. Now, yeah. the songs that you guys sung in the band, mm -hmm. first of all, I, I, what was the name of the band? Did you guys have a name? I don't think we had a name. <laughs> Okay, let me ask you. <laughs> I, I, I don't even think we had a name. I think it was just the Coast Guard Band. I think it was just the Coast Guard Band. I guess so. Now, what kind you of music were you guys? I will, I will make a call when, uh -huh. you know, sometime in the future, I'll make a call and, and get in contact with Ron Gandhi. What was the name of our band in the Coast Guard? <laughs> I don't think we had a name, honestly. Yeah, you guys yeah. were just having fun. But let me ask you, the, um, the music that you all were singing in the band, were you writing fresh music, your own music, or you were just, oh, no. you know, singing whatever was in you know, out there, whatever was songs. trending? Yeah, all the popular songs that was around at that time, we sing those. We didn't have time to sing and write any songs. And we, we sang the songs that we were already familiar with, you know. So, so let me tease you on this. What was uh -huh. your favorite song singing? What was a must for you? There had to be one of those. Okay, there was, there was a, a soca song that was big at that time, and it was... Let me, let me give you a little, I, I, I can't remember all the words, but it was, uh -huh. it was a merchant song. Merchant okay. in all past, God rest his soul. It was, would you like to rock it with me? Baby. Mm -hmm. Would you like, would you like to, rock to rock it with me, honey? That was one of, that was one of my favorite <laughs> songs. <laughs> uh, so so that, was, that was your song, kind of, sort of, because I know that sometimes as a budding artist, there is something that just locks in with you you know what i mean you lock and step with and it's like when you do this particular thing whatever it is you just yeah. feel good so merton yeah, songs. Two songs like that um mm -hmm. the songs like casanova remember that song um oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. I, I, can you see how much I love you? Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, Casanova. Remember that song? Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was a song I really liked. Yeah. You know, like, I never had, no, I can't even remember the lyrics to it. That's, that's it's sad. Okay. Cool. It's okay. At least you bring the hum and, you know, we were able to figure it out. That's good there enough. Go. And we yeah. were able to finish. What was your worst experience as a Coast Guard? Whew. Worst experience as a Coast Guard? I don't know. Um, it was that good? Yeah, I can't remember. Honestly, it was a really good six years. I can't remember saying this was the worst experience I've had because there were, there were rough times. There were times when you go to rescue people from floods. There were times when, when you, you, you know, you, oh, I remember what, was, what, could, what could be, what could be, deemed my worst experience in Coast Guard. I was working at the commander's house, the commanding officer's house. And I did, I, I mistakenly, I discharged around. Yeah. Yeah. I discharged around for my weapon, which is a, which is a no, no, which is a no, no. How did that happen? This was playing the fool. You're young and you're stupid and you're playing the fool with the government weapon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm being wow. brutally honest here with you. I'm being brutally honest with wow. you. Wow, wow. Uh, was action taken against you for it? How was it um, noted? I, I had to pay for the repairs on the wall in the commanding officer's house. Okay. Because I, <laughs> I put a bullet hole in his wall. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you the question a different way. 
Mm -hmm. Is there any experience you had while serving that you would like to forget? No. 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 Good. That's the honest truth. I thought it was all fun. It was all good. Uh huh. You know, it was. It was just an amazing time. I mean, I, I worked on, on vessels. I worked um, on, the, on a guard. I worked, you know, mm -hmm. small boats. I, I worked on the station, you know, so it was all good. It was okay. all good. Okay. I tell you what, let's take another peek at some of your work and then we'll come back and talk some more. How about that? All righty. All right. Ladies be cool, cause rock a rule, no sing, raga, boom, boom, raga, boom, boom, raga, boom, boom, raga, boom, boom, rogers and boys, hey, make some noise, rogers and boys, make some noise, let me sing, yeah, everybody, put your honey in the air. Unhappy, some singing, some dancing, some whining, some screaming, jumping, and we carry it on. Boy, 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 he's back together. Jumping, and we have fun. Boy, 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 he's back together. Rock a pump, pump, rock a pump, pump, boy. Man, we let both sing money come. Rock a pump, pump, rock a pump, pump, boy. So we can sing till morning come. Hey, we can dance. We gotta be jamming. Boom. Someone do wing on, have some fun, boom boom short, all color, boot boss, hey, hey, oh, wow, jump, hey, 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 in the chair raga boom boom raga boom boom um <clears throat> okay miss rose please behave yourself so those of you who've just joined us i am sitting today with unslam douglas and you just heard one of his hits raga boom boom no <laughs> i want to go back in your head you're smiling why are you smiling you were checking out my moves what because i you and i had a conversation about this wine a long time ago, we've had this conversation about the wine. So, okay, yes, you know, let me just clear the air because I don't want you to give people the wrong impression about me. No, so, no, let no. me quickly huh? I explain myself here, please. I want to take a minute to explain myself. Go ahead, so, folks. What Anselm is talking about was, I think it was last year or something like that. Mm -hmm. He was performing at the Ghana uh, Folk Festival, which is a program, an annual program hosted by the Ghana Cultural Association. And I was the MC and standing on the side, a band was playing and I'm a dancer. I was doing some pelvic movements, innocently doing some <laughs> pelvic movements that he refers to as a wine. So I just wanted to clear the air that that's what he's talking about. He's tickled about it and I would not give him an opportunity to even defend something else. So, <laughs> Moving right along. I hope your PhD is in law, eh? Because you're very good. You're very good. No, it's not. It's in behavioral studies, it's which is kind of sort of. Pelvic movement. Okay. Yes. Oh. As a dancer, we talk about pelvic movements. Okay. So your singing began uh, in church, right? Mm hmm When did you know that your career took off as a singer? As a singer. We're not talking about coming up in the church and all of that. We know that it began in the church. Right. When did you get that 
mm, in your stomach that your career as a singer took off? When, when, well, when Carl Beaver Henderson came to me that night at the talent show and said, I want you to be, you have a, that, what he said, I, he said, you have a job in the band as soon as this competition is over. That was a piece of excitement, just knowing that, I know he didn't hire me as a, as a bass player or as a drummer, he was talking vocals, right? So I said, wow, I'm, you know, I'm good enough to be, to be, you know, contracted by Firefly, the leader of Firefly. So that sparked something in me. I always knew that I wanted to sing and I could sing and I could do that, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think when I left the Coast Guard, there was a, there was a, a, a low period because the band Firefly had kind of dismantled and it was no more. And there was a, there was a lull period there for just about a year. Just, mm -hmm. no, not about a year, that's, that's too long. A few months because I left the Coast Guard on the 15th of October. Oh, you remember? And, you just celebrated an anniversary last week. Yes, I did. Or 10 yes, days I ago, because today's the 25th. Would have been, that, would have been, that would have been 36 years. Wow. 36 years. Yes. How many years have you been in the business? The music business? Yeah. About 30 years. Okay, okay. But don't, don't, don't add them up together and think right. about it. No, I get it. I get it. Uh huh. That would put me at 66 now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were saying though, but there was a lull. Um, after there was a lull, a lull, in, a lull in, in performances and all that stuff, and it was a very frustrating time because now there's no there's no income from Coast Guard, there's no music going on, and strange enough, this this gentleman by the name of Kenny Phillips, he came to me and he said, "I want you to do a compilation of the hit songs from the last carnival." I said, okay. He said, but it's going to be done in medley form. So it's one song going to go into the other. Mm -hmm. He say, you think you could do that? I say, I'm ready. Because I wasn't doing anything musical. So I went into the studio. He sent me the list of songs. It's all songs that I am familiar with because they were the big songs for the carnival that just went. Mm -hmm. So now he's taking all these songs, um, I think about 12 or 15 of them, and doing a medley compilation medley of them you know so you'll do like two verses and a chorus and then we just slide into another song and you know mm -hmm. and when I went into the studio I just let it all as they say let it all hang out I just gave it my everything and uh, I think it was the first time in the in the music in, in the in the soca industry or in the calypso industry where someone actually went on a record and started performing on the record as opposed to singing the songs. Mm -hmm. So I was on the record with my, on, in the studio with my hands on my ears and I'm performing like if I am in a fet. Mm -hmm. so I'm singing the songs and talking to an audience that is not there and telling them to do certain things and, and you know, jump and take out your rag and run up the road and, mm -hmm. and talking to individuals uh -huh. that's not there. You know, yeah. they're not there, but I'm talking to them. So when you listen to it now, you swear that you're in a fet. And by the time it was released, this medley, I kid you not, started to play so much. I and all started to get tired of hearing my own voice in the radio. You know, but a lot of people were like, who is that guy? Because a few people knew me from Fire Flight. But now I am everywhere on the airwaves, constantly, every radio station is pounding this medley round the clock. And as a result of that, I realized I'm there. Okay. I'm there. Everybody knows my name. My voice is everywhere on the radio. People are asking about me. People want to know who's this person. So I realized, okay, my career has taken off. You know, so, I'm yeah. just I'm juxtaposing what you just said with what we mm -hmm. saw. When we took a peek at your work, we listened to a peek of your work. It was just the, the cover of the album that we watched, right? And we're listening to your voice, Raga Pum Pum, just now. Right. And I'm thinking back in the time, back in that time, that there, time was no yeah. there was no music video, right? Right, yeah. There but, no they music had a video. Few, but they had a few, but the music videos were like, you stand up on a, on a stage and somebody with a camera just videotape you singing the song. Yeah, no but it, uh, you know when I say music video, I what I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean I exactly what you back mean, yeah. then to now what we have, a, a music video now. I was talking with one of my buddies who was on this program a few weeks ago, who's a singer. When we look at um, 
and that person is Courtney Noel, shouting out Courtney. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about when you look at music videos today, mm -hmm. they're like a whole film. If you don't remind yourself, you know, it's like a three to five minute short film you're watching. Yeah, a, movie, and, a, a mini movie, a mini movie. Yeah, a movie. Yeah, you know, it's like really, and and you know, I'm also listening to you to talk about you're in the studio recording and you're so animated, you're bringing the, the lyrics to life. Guess yeah, what? Yeah. You had good practice for today in COVID-19 because that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing a lot. And I don't mean to make light of COVID-19. Yeah, but I know what you mean, though. The mm -hmm. point that I'm making is, is that as artists, we don't know what that journey uh, really, um, what it sets us up for yeah. that is to come in mm -hmm. our future because yeah. it, it it has its place in your life as a singer you know it oh, yeah. does oh, yeah. it does so as a professional singer who were the individuals cheering you on who has been an undying fan of yours whether it's high low or in between i think my number one fan from then to now and my number one critique from then to now is my brother is you who my brother your brother okay he was there from from because he was always a fetter he was a fat man i i always tell people i am not a fat person my job took me into the fets you know mm -hmm. and i i would go and perform and then 20 minutes after that you know you might take a picture with a fan and in those days they didn't have phones to do that so you know you might give somebody an autograph and and you know and then you're gone mm -hmm. but i was never a fat person to say oh i'm going to this fat or i'm going to that fat because that's my job that's why i work you know i don't know i don't know if any school teacher when they're off to say I'm, I'm going in school and hang out you know or any policeman who when they're off say i'm going to the precinct to hang out mm -hmm. you know so as, a, as an entertainer performing in the FETs, it was kind of weird for me now to say I'm going to FET because I feel like this is where I work, you know. But my brother, he was there from jump. He was there from jump. I mean, in the FETs, prancing up in front of the stage when I am performing. <laughs> you know, when I put out a song, he would tell me, you know, his nickname for me is Tall Boy. He said, Tall Boy, I am feeling that one, you know, I am feeling that one. Or oh, tall boy, you're going to you're going to mash up with this one. You're going to mash up with this one, you know. And he would be brutally honest. He'd be brutally honest. What critique did he give you that was not favorable, um, if any? He would tell me, um, okay. He would say, he would say, you know, you know, your style have to change because your songs are too much of lyrics in it. Still, you know, that was back then. You had to less lyrics, less lyrics, and and. And, and more jam and wine because I was always a writer, you know, and, and there we always had disagreement because I would tell him, listen, you can't tell me you write a song and cannot read a song. Reading and writing goes together. Mm -hmm. So if you write a song, you should be able to read your song. And when you read your song, it should make sense. I, I come from that school, you know, of course there are songs. Okay. Look at the song we just played, Raga Pum Pum. People say, that's a nonsense song. Well, if you listen to the lyric, you know, mm -hmm. everyone find someone to have fun. You know, you know, it's just about, you, you set up the party vibe, but it's still making sense. And at that time, Raga Pum Pum Shorts was the thing. Mm -hmm. And Raga was now coming out. It was Raga Pum Pum, you know, and, and we played on the two words and it, it became a big thing. But to say that I am going to try to write nonsense, I can't do it. I, 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 I can't promise anybody to do that. And basically what he was saying was, you're singing with too much lyrics, too much words. People don't want to hear words. They just want to tell them run up the road, tell them jump, tell them <laughs> uh -huh. so, I, so, so we had a disagreement there on that, you know. Okay. That's the number one critic, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> like... I like that. So he was more into the soca then and not the calypso. Oh, yeah. And I'm he, just going back to what what you your definition of. No, he was he was he was more of a soca man, but he he loved the calypso tents and he loved calypsos and all that. And sometimes okay. wherever they might be in the world and they're having some sort of um 
heated discussion about, about the culture. You pick up, you say, hold on, hold on. Let me call my brother. He know everything about culture. He <laughs> <laughs> said, so, boy, in one year, so and so and so happened. And I'll say, well, uh, that's not, hold on, hold on. Oh, that was in so and so because this was happening at the same time. And you say, you see what all this? <laughs> you <know>? Wow. So, <laughs> It's like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Love it. So you've had quite a few hits. Raggle Pum Pum, that we just heard, that we just mm -hmm. heard. Um, Stick Fight. Yeah. When I did, da, 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 da. Oh, gosh, I love that song. And I guess because of the rhythm behind it, you know, mm -hmm. I, yeah. I love that song. And, mm -hmm. of course, there is Who Let the Dogs Out, right? Right. Which brought you a Grammy. Right. Take us through the life of Doggy, who let the dog out, the okay. dog out, up to the Grammy Award. Okay, so there's oh, who a- wrote the, Wait, one second, who wrote the song? I did, I did. You did, okay, yeah. so take us, take us through. So let's, 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 in fact, we'll make that correction when I get to the very end. Okay. Now, I was living in Toronto and my then brother-in-law, he would come to the house and he would always be saying, who let the dogs out? You know, he has a big voice because he was a radio announcer, a DJ, or he had a big kind of blah, 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 kind of voice, you know? Okay. So he was, why don't write a song like that, man? Why don't write to say, that song so American, that would never work. You know, as I, he said, that is going to work as a super song. I know what I'm telling you. And he went on with that for close to two years. I kid you not. Close to two years, he harassed me on doing this thing. So I said, you know what? Okay, I'm going to sit down and write this song. And I wrote two versions. One, in hindsight, I knew, I know now it wouldn't work. It would not have worked because it was about a woman. It was, again, storytelling. The storytelling in me was started to come out. It was about a woman who came from grocery shopping or whatever, and her dog pulled all her, her lady undergarments off the line and had it scattered all over the yard. And she started screaming to the kids, who let the dogs out? Because look me this in the yard and me that in the yard and me this in the yard and me that in the yard, who let the dogs out, right? So it, it would have taken a more humorous kind of swing. And then I, I, I went over it, went over it, and then I just say, I scrapped it and I went back to the drawing board, completely different melody structure, completely diff different lyric and came up with the Who Let The Dogs Out as we know today. Mm -hmm. So that song was recorded back in 1997 for Carnival in Trinidad, 1998. So it would have been, I would have been in the studio in October, November to record it for 1998 and it was released and I honestly I did not like the production on it it was a horrible production great arrangement but the production was poor wasn't good at all but I think the hook line and the energy on the track was so strong it just took over the airwaves but you know as a as an entertainer as a as a as a, as a, I don't like to call myself a perfectionist, but as somebody who is doing this, you want to put the best work possible. And every time I hear that song, I'll be like, ooh, ooh, I'm hearing so many, you know, faults in the, in the production part of it, you know. But it went on and became just this huge song throughout the Caribbean. And then in 2000, I got a call from somebody, I don't know, just give me a call and say, hi, with a very strong American accent. Hi, my name is so-and-so and I'm calling concerning who let the dogs out and I heard that you were the writer and you owed the publishing for it. Now, in the music world, entertainers always pull in pranks on each other. We always do that. <laughs> so I'm thinking, I'm like, who is this playing the, mm -hmm. on the phone? And the guy says, hello, excuse me. <laughs> it, was, it was too real. It was too real. I know we always, you know, I would pick up the phone and try to put on an American accent and say, ah, this is so-and-so and so. But, you know, but you call another musician, just, just pulling his leg. So I am like, who is this? And then I realized this is for real. 
So the guy said, I said, who is this? He said, this is so-and-so and so-and-so I'm calling from this company and that's a publisher's calling. And I said, well, let's talk. So I put them onto my then manager and they had had their conversation. And lo and behold, before you know it, I'm on a flight back to Toronto because I was in Trinidad when I got that call. I was in Trinidad for Carnival 2000. And right after that, I'm, I'm back in Toronto and my manager is with me and we took the train down from Toronto into New York and here we are in Manhattan and we started to hammer out contracts. And it was like, whoa, this is happening so fast because they said, listen, we have a group that we would like to do a cover, we'd like them to do a cover version of the song, you know, and, um, but to do that, we would want part of the publishing. So at that point, I was not too hip to the whole publishing mm -hmm. um, aspect of the music industry. And um, lo and behold, they wanted 100% of the publisher's publishing. So they kept that and I kept 100% of the writer's publishing. And uh, as it went down, within months I heard contracts were signed, everything was up and in order. And lo and behold, I heard the version of the Baha Men now, which is the one we had the contract for. And when I heard that, I was like, eh, it sounds kind of watered down because it's, it's not as mm -hmm. high energy as the original. And you know, your ears become tuned to something. Yeah. You know, so when I heard when I heard the 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 Baha Men's version, at first it was like, eh. but then after listening to it, and anywhere you go, you couldn't help but hear it, you know. And then I remember being in New York, and uh, one of the gentlemen from the company called me and said, "Listen, we are we released the song, and in the first week." They were calling to apologize that in the first week they only sold 50,000 copies in the first week. Mm. You know, in that first week. So it was, it was just amazing how it happened. And before you know it, it just blew up a million copies, platinum, multi platinum, double platinum. And that's, that's, that's the story of Who Let the Dogs Out and Grammy. Yes, <laughs> and Grammy. yes. So, before you got that call that you thought that you thought was a prank call, mm -hmm. any indication that this song would would have become a hit? Because you're nope. saying that you didn't like the arrangement. No, nope. none. I just thought it would have been like a regular hit for Carnival and Trinidad, and then it would die a natural death, and then you release more music the following year, which is the normal cycle of the music. You know, you do a song, and most people try to pretend that they don't record for Carnival, but that's what we do. That's why we release. If not, we should be releasing music all through the year, but we usually release this bulk of music around carnival time. So we are still in the habit, in the bad habit of releasing music for carnival. carnival. And yeah. when, I, when I did that, that was my intention, to release a song for carnival, hope that it becomes very popular, and then I, I do my performances, I do the milk run, as I say, in all the different carnivals around the world, from Toronto to Montreal, Boston, Baltimore, Miami, New York, London, Sweden, wherever you go, you just travel and do your carnivals. And then you run the milk run and then you're back into the studio again. Mm -hmm. I never in, in my wildest dream thought that 20, you know, 22 years after, this song will still be a big song. What do you think is the catch, though, that keeps it on the airways the way that it is? And when you hear it, you just got to get up and dance. What do you think I is the catch? I think it's because it's relatable. You know, um, everybody knows you, you could be living in the North Pole or you could be living in Chile. You could be living in China. You could be living in Zimbabwe. Everybody knows what a dog is. It's like Arrow's song. Hot, hot, hot. Everybody yeah. knows. Oh, yeah. it's hot. It's relatable. <laughs> yeah. You know? So when you hear, who let the dogs out? It, it's, That's right. Yeah. You know, I, I know this. I can relate to but, this. But it's something about, it's, I, I, I'm thinking that we know what the song sounds like too. Yeah. Aside from the relatableness, I just made up yeah. that word. Um, <laughs> I like it. Can I use uh, it? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You have permission. I've just given you the rights. Um, aside from that, I think because it's in our heads already, Mm -hmm. as soon as we hear it i mean you just said it. you just give us a kind of a bar of yeah. it right and i was ready to hear the rest of it because of the call and response to you see call yeah. and response in music is so important 
because now you give the opportunity, you give the audience an opportunity, the listening audience an opportunity to be a participant in the performance. Yeah. So yeah. when I say, who let the dogs out? You know you have a line coming. Who? Who? You well, know I'm you jumping up to dance too. I'm right? jumping up to dance too. Right. You, you understand you, what I'm you saying? Know there's a line coming yeah. for you. Yeah. You know? And, and, and um, one of my favorite artists when it comes to, Calypso artists when it comes to call and response was the late, great Lord Kitchener. Mm. He would sing, um, um, I rather lie here by the gale, do ask me to walk for carnival. Da da ba da 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 da. Do ask me to. He, he'll always leave a line for you to sing. Yeah. You yeah. know. You say cockroach in my petticoat. Da 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 da. Cockroach in my petticoat. Gosh, yes, you're singing. You're singing there, and I'm thinking of my girlfriend Marva. I hope Marva, you're listening. Marva, <laughs> I hope you're watching Marvin Newton. Um. So. so I think those are the things, those are the elements in the song that cause yeah. it to just have that, that life. Now, how, that did, how did the, how did the Caribbean, well, how did Trinidad celebrate mm -hmm. the Grammy? I'm saying Trinidad because the thing is we, with our Caribbean people, you know, if anybody in the region gets recognized in terms of a Grammy award, it's like, it's like all of us Listen, got it. Was, it was crazy i mean i had the new york times calling me i had local papers calling me i had uh television stations from london calling because these are all places i performed mm -hmm. they're all aware of who i am and everybody is calling oh your song just won a grammy and it's just it's on and on and on and on and up to this is 20 how much years after and we're still talking about it. So. Yeah, yeah, well, we have to, we have to. You put it, right? It just went on and on. Yeah. And, you know, I don't want to sound too full of myself, but somewhere in the back of my head, I am thinking that it was a glimpse of things to come for me because I still believe my best recording years are ahead of me. Oh. Because where, where I am, where I am, in my level of maturity as a person, as a musician, as a writer, as somebody who understands the industry more, you know, I am, I think there's just some serious work to come still. God's sparing life that you is. You know, it's, it's funny you, you say that because the more we talk, I'm thinking, okay, I've listened to some of your newest music that you've been writing. And I'm also thinking stardom hit when you won the grammy award mm -hmm. and it's 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 just it, it it's it's humbling to hear you say that your best years are ahead of you and i do believe it because of what i've been privy to hear in terms of your writing um to read in terms of your writing and to hear the songs mm -hmm. that you have written yeah. uh, what are your thoughts about the song post grammy and its effects on you as an artist moving forward? Um, post Grammy, well, let's talk about the effect it, 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 it has and continue to have on me. Uh, it, it, it pushes me to, to do better. It pushes me to do better because I don't think any Olympic runner who won the gold medal say, well, okay, I'm good. I'm good now. <laughs> I don't think any heavyweight boxer who won the heavyweight championship say, okay, I'm good. I just wanted to do that. No, I'm good. Mm -hmm. You always want to do better. You always, you always want to challenge yourself. And um, so that's the effect that it, it's had on me and it, it's still having that effect. It's still pushing me in that direction to, to do better, to do better. Mm -hmm. I remember when I, when I recorded songs like, um, Jump and mash up the party. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. It's everybody, jump, jump and mash up the party. Every, you know, and when they drive through Port of Spain and San Fernando, everybody's like, everybody, you know, <laughs> you know. Uh -huh. And then, then you come and you did raga pom pom. It's like we say raga pom pom. Everywhere you go, they call you by your song. <laughs> you know. Now it's who let the dogs out? I think they've been calling me that for too long. I need, I need a new name. Okay. <laughs> It's, it's been pushing me to do better work because I always say as an artist, you don't do work for yourself. 
Yeah. You know, you do work for your audience, for your fan, your fan base, the people who've been supporting you, who expect you to put out good work, to, to, you know, just to support you. And because else I'd sing in my bathroom. Oh, yeah. I'd be comfortable singing in my bathroom. But I yeah. don't sing for me. I, I get on the stage, I get in the studio, I, I pick up my pen and paper and write, trying to bring some sort of message, some sort of, you know, there's a song, there's a song that I wrote years ago. It, it never became a popular song and it was never meant to be a party song. I call it a musician's prayer. And, and the, the lyric in the last will says, father of music, um, who summoned musicians to play? Let me bring joy and laughter to some lonely heart today. And when my rendition's over and the applause come to a halt, I want to give you the glory and your mighty name exalt. You know, because the whole idea about me writing is to bring happiness and joy and, and some, some touch some emotional part of a human being to make them feel I could go on or yeah. nice or mm-hmm. make them laugh or bring awareness or whatever. There must be some message in the music. And if I could capture that message and continue to capture that message, then I'm doing what I was created to do. Hey, mm-hmm. that's a good point for us to take a peek at some more of your work and then we come back and we chat some more. For okay. those of you who've joined us late, Anselm Douglas, singer, songwriter, author, is chatting with me today and we thank you for joining us. Let's take a peek at some more of your work, Anselm. I checked my mail this morning I saw an address I don't know Several times I tried deleting But for hell it can go It came with an attachment Scarce that no virus is found I was bubbling with excitement But till at least fell to number one But that wasn't you Kissing you Doing things that you said That you will never do Oh, she had one just to say Now I know these things can happen Because it wasn't custom made I clicked open with the slideshow And was convinced totally It wasn't you up in them photos Cause you never do those things to me Oh, that wasn't you Kissing you Doing things that you said That you will never do Please tell me it's not you. I know it wasn't you. Oh. 
It wasn't you. Wow. I love that. It's so nice and smooth and okay, Rose, behave yourself. So for those of you joining us, I'm sitting with Anselm Dantla, singer, songwriter, and author. So Anselm. Well, I know it wasn't you. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. And I'm not referring to Shaggy right now. So I'm oh, referring to oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, It Wasn't You by Anselm Douglas. We just heard a snippet of it. I love the video too. It's Listen, for you guys watching, please Google Anselm. Go on YouTube. You'll see more of his work. So as a singer and songwriter, you have reinvented yourself. This is my assessment. Mm -hmm. And you've, re you've reinvented yourself in the sense that you were able to move back and forth, you know, between different genres of music. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we heard Rock a Boom Boom, we heard To Let the Dog Out, you know, and then we just heard this nice, soft, jazzy, R&B-like, smooth, right. you know. And, uh, and, I, and I believe most individuals would know you for your Soka Calypso Yes, genre, is, you know, yeah. and mm -hmm. and now the difference with uh, hearing the texture of your voice differently uh, based on the arrangement of the music and all of that, we are able to hear you differently, see you differently, and you might even lose some fans because folks might just love you with jump on wave, wine and go down white, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> and some yeah. people might be like, what? He's singing this kind of music now? Uh, so I, I'm thinking that they may take some who might be slow to really embrace the, the soft, the soulful, the R&B-ish, the jazz-ish side of you, but it's okay because I, I, I love it. Now, you wrote that song, right? Yes. So I want to get into your head now about the songwriting. Mm -hmm. I know that you, growing up, you admired people Bryson, you know, James Ingram, yeah. and you kind of sort of got that groove going for you mm -hmm. as a singer who is embracing um, R&B, who's singing R&B and smooth jazz music. Now, why the change? Um, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to label it as a change uh, because I have always, remember I came from that. I came from gospel and I remember in the early days, um, even, even in, in that, that little period, um, when I was managing my uncle's hotel be between there and Coast Guard, I used to be doing little gigs in San Fernando in little pubs and clubs, you know, little gigs, um, just doing Lionel Richie's, the Commodores at the time and doing, mm -hmm. you know, um, what's his name? Um, oh gosh, his name wouldn't come to me now, but I, I would, I would do their music, which was R&B music. So it, it's, it's something that I always knew. It's something that I always knew. But, so but I, I wouldn't call it a change. I yeah. hear you. And, and it's good that you're really uh, shedding light on it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. The reason I asked the question that way is because, like I said, most people right. who don't know your background mm -hmm. would say, hmm, what's up with Anselm now? You yeah. know, why okay. the change, quote right. unquote. I, I so, <laughs> so I'm glad that you, you're able to really clarify that's not a change. This is what I grew up with. Yeah. You know, I'm just doing what I've always done. It's more of an incorporation. It's more of an incorporation to widen widen my performance scope because now when I go on stage I could I could start off doing something easy listening like what you just heard and we could end up with with raga pum pum at the end with people with a shirt off in the air and we're having a good time. Right. But it's how you how you 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 gradually slip into that because mm -hmm. it's kind of I've seen where I've been at functions where people are in jacket and tie and by the end of the performance as we say, we say, we're we back, we shot. <laughs> you know, jacket off, tie off. Yes. People wearing a jacket in the air, but they That's were sitting right. by the table nice and decent before. But, <laughs> it, you know, because you move from, you move from mm. your smooth jazz yeah. into a little reggae, into yeah. a little calypso, into a little soca, and before you know it, people winding down. You know, I, let me testify. I think I would be one of those. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I would be <laughs> 
So this song, um, this particular one, and I'm getting to this genre of music. Mm -hmm. What do you enjoy about writing music? And I'm talking about your songwriting too. What do you enjoy about writing music? I'll tell you what I enjoy most. Every song, everything started from an idea. The man who invented the kettle, it came from an idea. You know, so you have you have an idea in your head or a vibe come, you know, energy comes. And you pick up your pen and your paper and you start writing and a melody is coming and it's like, to, to see that idea move from an idea to something on pen and paper, just to being in the studio recording, to putting music and meet around it and then releasing that and seeing people dance and have a good time to your idea. I think that is the most fulfilling thing in the world that people could actually have a good time to what was an idea in your head. You know, a few months ago, that was just an idea. That's it. Okay. So let me ask you, I'm going to push the envelope a little bit. Mm -hmm. With this song, and I'm just looking at this one because we just played it. But it could be any of your soft, slow jams. Mm -hmm. Is it more of, a, of an idea or an experience? Some of them is a combination of both. Okay. All right. All right. Because I'm thinking because for, for you to really grasp your listenership, for you to grasp your audiences, mm -hmm. it has to be relatable. We talk about that relatableness. Right. And Relatability. <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and I am thinking that because of ideas and because of life's experiences, people are able to draw, be drawn in because it's like, hmm, kind of been there, done that. I mean, I on a different show, we program, we'll be talking about the fan fantasy of love, right? Because there's so many great singers who've talked, who've sung about love. They mm -hmm. made us feel that we know what love is. But like I right. said, that's for a whole different program. But right. I think with, with coming back to your style, um, to hear you say it's a combination of ideas and experiences, I think sometimes, that was some, fair. Sometimes it's just... I think the idea is to be able to paint a picture. If I could paint a picture in your head, if I could tell you a story and make you visualize what I am saying. As I checked my mail this morning, I saw an address I don't know. Several times I tried deleting, but not for hell it wouldn't go. In your mind, when the first line comes, as I checked my mail this morning, I saw an address I don't know. At that point, you haven't you're not on the computer as yet. You're just thinking mail. But from the time I mentioned, several times I tried deleting, but for hell it wouldn't go. Mm -hmm. It said open with a slideshow. And I, I can't remember the lyric go now. But mm -hmm. when I open with a slideshow, I'm seeing pictures of, I'm saying, wait a minute, that's, that's my girl. You know, but it's, it's, I'm, I'm doubting and saying that wasn't you. It, it, it couldn't be you. Mm -hmm. You know, because then I'm thinking she, the, the pearl earrings that I got you, she had one just the same. But I know these things can happen because it wasn't custom made. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm, I'm finding excuses why that, it could never be you. It could never be but you. but let me let me say this: I'm listening to you share the lyrics with us, mm -hmm. and I'm also thinking that there might be somebody else who is listening and watching, saying, "Yeah, Rose, maybe not so." Mm. Because I'm also thinking about the element of fantasy too. Right. Because they are, we are some creative beings, you know. <laughs> we are some creative beings in the art. So I'm also thinking fantasy, you know. Sometimes our, our minds take us to places that others cannot understand. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, for the painter, for the artist, it would be abstract art right that you watch at and you know the the painter might not want to tell us everything about this everything particular about, painting you know but you. with I with with writing music it's like really hmm i wonder you know so your thoughts about that well, about the fantasy piece there, there's, there's always fantasy because i i have i have written songs that it's 
pure fantasy. Um, I have a song called Money, you know, and it's all fantasy. It's saying, I want money. I want Bill Gates kind of money, Rockefeller kind of money, you know, um, because I, I want I want to sick the house with a six car garage and and I want a whole entourage and I want I want a daily massage and I want all these good things. <laughs> you know, I want all these things. I want money, but it's 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 fantasy, and most of us, most of us will never experience that level of wealth, but it's nice to fantasize yeah. about it. It's very nice to fantasize. You know, sometimes we sing about a girl, even in even in in, in in rap music, when you hear people rapping and they're talking about the driving down the street and the this and the that, some of these brothers don't own a car. Yeah. Some of these brothers don't own a car. <laughs> I, I could do not. And you see them in their rap videos with big gold chain around their neck and all of that. They don't own that stuff. They're getting ready to own it, though. For some huh? of them, for some so of them, they're getting ready to own they're it. They're getting ready to own it, but they gotta paint the picture like I've made it. Yeah, I've made it, and and you know you fake it till you make it. You know, and that's okay. That's okay too. <laughs> you know, so there's so, the fantasy element in it. Yeah. Oh, good, 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 good. I'm glad to hear you say that because sometimes, and and I'm just pulling from some of my colleagues in the field the kind of work that they do and 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 it doesn't even have to be the performing arts like mm -hmm. i said you know so what is your preferred genre these days i know i might be putting you on the spot there um soccer will always be my baby you know because i, I i'm from that you know but i i love music i I honestly, I love music. It's like asking some, you know, you ask a woman, you know, she has children of her own and she loves her children, but she loves children generally. I love music, but music must not just be about the three elements that create a song, which is lyric, melody, and beat. It must be, it must send you somewhere, take you somewhere. You know, I, I want to do music where I, I like music where when it gets to the end of the song, you want to play it over again because I want to hear it again. There's something I feel I missed. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it, it might sound really weird, but I am in love with music. I'm truly in love with the idea of a song. You know, think about this. Think about this. The average song is three minutes and 25 seconds. Give or take. And three minutes and 25 seconds could, and let's look at the look at let's look at the financial side here. Three minutes and 25 seconds could put $35 million in your pocket if done correctly. Three minutes and 35 seconds of proper work. Well, that's the final product, but it, it took mm -hmm. hours and hours and hours of work to right. get it to three minutes and 35 seconds, right? Three minutes of 35 seconds could make make young girls lie in their bed at night and tears run down and flood their ears because they're just staring at the ceiling crying over this song. The song does that to them. Three minutes and 35 minutes and 25 seconds, three minutes and 25 seconds could make a man kneel on his knee and open a box and say, would you marry me? You know, when, 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 when a song could do that, we're talking music. And the song doesn't even have to have lyrics. Sometimes you hear a, a violinist play or a trumpeter blow, and it's like, it, you feel it here, man. It's like, yeah. whoa, yeah. whoa, <laughs> you know? <laughs> All right, so let me swing the pendulum differently here. What mm -hmm. is the biggest disappointment you ever experienced in writing? I'm going in writing here. In writing? Did you write something that you never, you didn't like, or after you've written it, you, you didn't even bother to look back? Um, I think my, I think on, on the flip side of that, my disappointment is writing songs that I know they're really good songs lyrically, but the market wasn't ready for it. Oh. You know? Um, now, do you have those in a pile waiting to bring them back or something like that? No, no. Um, okay, like you were just, you were just, we just played Raga Pum Pum and I was thinking, maybe I should call Lester and Paul and tell them, let's do over that song. Let's do it over, same energy, same vibe. Just, just bring it into this century now, you know, with <coughs> like, you know, because the song has a beautiful melodic line, even though the lyrical content is not as 
thought provoking, but from a from a, 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 a the energy that that song brings, the melodic structure, the musical arrangement. If we could take that and bring it here now, and give it a whole new treatment, whoa! Why not? I was just thinking about that. But why my, not? <laughs> I know, I know. But my, I think my biggest disappointment. I, I have a song called Okay. I think I sent you this song, a song called Abuse, which I wrote over 20 years ago and released. And okay, so I don't even want to go there right now. All right. Okay. I don't even want to go there right now, but yeah. I want to yeah. ask you something else. If you had the opportunity to collaborate with another singer, in a few words, few sentences, because I want us to look at more of your work, who would that person be? Right now, India Irie. I love her. Ah. Tracy Chapman, and I know these are not these are not chat toppers, but those are artists that I just love. I, I love the but they're unique. They're very yeah, yeah. unique in their yeah. own right. The pureness of their music, the realness of it. Uh -huh. So it's Tracy Chapman, um, I love I love Shade. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, <laughs> but let me ask you, what mm -hmm. about these women? What would you bring to their music, and what would they bring to your music? How do you see the collaboration? Let's say with Tracy Chapman. Um, what what the, about the texture of Tracy's music with the texture of yours that you think would make I, a good marriage for a I collaboration? Think we share, I think we, should, I think we, we and I don't, I don't want to, to give myself too much of credit, but I think we kind of cut from the same cloth. You know, I think we have this, this natural, not trying to, to really impress people. We're just trying to do our music and do it to the best of our ability. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, like me and Tracy, if we if if we ever get the opportunity to just sit down and and work on a topic, and it, it it could be a topic about love or it could be a topic about world events, I think it's going to be a good collaboration, you know, because I think we we kind of see it through the same lens, kind of way. Listening listening to her vibe, you know, and feeling her vibe. Yeah, Charlie is just pure sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I respect know. your honesty. I yeah. respect your honesty, Anslem. So mm -hmm. just now you wanted to uh, take us to abuse. And the reason why I ask you to pause on that is because I want us to really get into your platform here. Mm -hmm. um, but let me just say hi to my friends who might be joining us late. Anslem Douglas, song or, uh, singer, songwriter, and author is sitting with me this afternoon. So if you joined us late, he is who I'm talking with. So Break the Cycle is one of the songs that supports, um, you lend support to the platform of domestic violence with, yeah. and there's a song Abuse, mm -hmm. right? Now, for those of you who aren't paying attention, this month is a lot, uh, this month is, is so, it's about so many observances, of course, breast cancer awareness, and now we're talking about domestic violence, which is a huge plague in our society. And if you weren't paying attention to the percentages on, on uh, domestic violence activities went up because of COVID-19. Yeah. Why? Because many individuals, many victims are locked in the homes with the perpetrator with no place to go because of the nature of the pandemic and it's there also i want to say and i and if you didn't pay attention i put on my social work hat on you there i just switched um but i also want to bring our attention to the fact that perpetrators are also women yes it's not just men who are perpetrators and domestic violence happens in any relationship whether you're straight whether you're you're same sex whether in other words whether you're in a homosexual re relationship heterosexual relationship it is present and i have to applaud you and slam for taking this platform on because it's very important and i need to put a plug for me I have a very small clip I posted on Facebook today about domestic violence. It is related to a release done by Angel's Caribbean band because they had released a song also about domestic violence, but the message is very strong. If you get a chance, please listen to it. Please share it. 
but back to you and Slim. Break that cycle. Give us a few, sing us, sing us, a, sing us a, a verse of break that cycle. Well, let, let me, well, I'll just sing it and <clears throat> let me see if I can clear my throat here. It's okay. Like, um, she shatters each time he tries to touch her face. See the tears roll down for so long. She has been treated like this. But still no place to run. And he tells her it's your fault. You make me do these things. But I love you in spite of. And that's the reason why I'm staying. And you should be glad to have someone like me. Although at times I could be rough. But it's because I love you, can't you see, old oh girl? Now go get yourself cleaned up. Mm. Break that cycle. Break it. Lend the box up here. Break that cycle. Break it. Send a message loud and clear. Break that cycle. Break it. Let the love begin at home. Break that cycle. Break it. I stand with you. You're not alone. Mm. You know, so. Thank you, thank you. It's so, you have to pay attention to the lyrics yeah. and it's a different type of paying attention because it wants to start off or it does start off like a lovey-dovey song, you know? And in so many different ways, that's what the perpetrator wants so to, start to And to even, even, during, even during the violence, he's still telling her, that you should be glad to have someone like me. Yeah. You know, he's he's beating the crap out of her and saying, you know, you, you know, I, I, I'm here because I love you. So just go get yourself cleaned up, you know. Yeah. So it he's still he's still promoting that I love you when he's it's just yeah. a sick thing, man. It's just a yeah. sick thing. Yeah, it is. It is a sickness. It is a sickness. So I'm aware that you've written songs that address the ills of society, period. But this particular one hits home for this month, especially. Yes. No, and you have the other one, Abuse, that I'll ask you to give us another a verse mm -hmm. out. But why have you chosen domestic violence as a platform, as a singer? Um, when I was a little boy growing up, I always thought it weird, like really weird that it was taken as almost second nature for a man. And in those days, you would only hear of a man being violent to a woman. You wouldn't hear the other way. So it was, it was, it was, I was always taken back when you hear a man beat his wife. And it was, it was almost, people would always make fun of it in the village. Like, you know, and, and I would say it like how we would say, it, I hear he well beat she last night. Ha ha ha. Like it was almost comical. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't strange to see a man beat his woman in public, tear down her clothes in public, slap her around in public, or the neighbors hearing a woman being taken advantage of by her husband, her significant other, and nobody says anything. You call the police back then and they would say, that's domestic business. We don't get involved in that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I grew up. And I was in an interview of, a few weeks ago and was talking about this song with Lord Nelson where he talk about um, to see man, one of the lines in the song is to see man beating woman is not uncommon. We like it. Mm -hmm. you know, because it, 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 it became such a norms in society. Yeah. It's almost like accepted. Yeah. I just thought it was really weird and it was wrong and I, I decided to you know what. I am going to make this my platform. I am going to be the person out there who is, you know, working to bring awareness to this cause. And that was, that, that's where it all You came. know, it's funny that you said that though, because when, when domestic violence is talked about and there's reflection about how it was handled in the Caribbean region, mm -hmm. like you brought up Lord Nelson's song, there is, um, what's his name? Mighty Sparrow, you know, Black Up Shy, Bruce Up Shani, Then You Love Me, and then when you look at some of the folk songs, 
that you sang yeah. that are, you know, coming from the respective islands. There was yeah. that element of abuse there and nobody was thinking. And even now, you know, scholars are arguing in research um, forums about, oh, it, it, it was, uh, it's just satire. It's not, it's not, it, it's folk, it's this and that, but a lot of old folk determine exactly, somewhere. yeah, it determine where we came from, where we are and where we're going. I'm glad to see though that there's been that shift, you know, where there are, where there are um, artists like yourself who are singing against these ills of society. And, you know, it, it's, it's a good, it's a great thing. It's a wonderful thing. How difficult or how easy it is, is it for you to write, was it for you to write, break that cycle and abuse? Um, I think once you, once you understand you, you, had the opportunity to read the newspaper about situations and circumstances that led to domestic violence, you could, you know, because you hear, you hear villagers as a young boy, you hear villagers saying, anytime he get drunk, he'll just go home and beat his wife. So you, get, you start to get an understanding of, of how things work out and how things play out. So when you start to write all these little things from your past and your, you know, little gossips that you heard in the village and all of that started to come into play and it, there your, your experience, experiences kind of contribute to your, your creativity, mm -hmm. you know, so it, it, it's difficult writing topics like that, but it's not difficult to write. Okay. Got it. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, 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 I get it. I get it. Especially if you have that place, um, that place of experience with, in terms of viewing it, hearing about it, growing up in it and, and just knowing as a child too, that it doesn't feel right. It doesn't yeah, sound right. It doesn't look right. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And you know what is funny too? This thing is happening in high school. This is happening with boyfriend and girlfriend. Don't think that it's happening in, in marriage relationships. This is happening with young teenagers who are in a relationship, be it um, boy and girl or boy and boy or girl and girl. There's always the one who feels that, you know, I'm in charge. Yeah. You know, and but, to flex their chest and flex their muscles and... You know, I mean, it, it really speaks to the truth. It speaks to the fact. It speaks to research that children model behavior. There you go. There yeah. you go. Children there model you go. behavior. So we can have a whole different show about this and you don't want to get me started on it. That'd be <laughs> <There you go. laughs> Then we won't be talking about you. So give us one verse of um, of abuse before we um, wrap up this piece about domestic yeah. violence. I'm trying to remember how abuse go now and I've been talking so long. I gotta remember the song. Um, All right, if you don't remember, it's fine. We can talk about other things. I don't want to yeah. push you to remember, all right? Yeah. But, well, listen, let's take a peek at some more of your work, another angle of your work. How about okay. that? Sounds okay, good. good. Mm -hmm.
Metro Bill and pull down the music. Hey, how you feel, yeah, yo? Before the thing gets in out of hand, yeah, man, how you feel, yeah, yo? Cause everybody started singing it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yo. From the DJ to the barman, I hear the party singing. Who let the dogs out? Who, 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 who let the dogs out? Who, 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 Get back, di di da da di da di da di da 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 da. Who let the dogs out? You know, this is the part when I get to make up my own lyrics because own I don't lyrics, pay yeah. attention. This I don't do pay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had to play that song for those of you joining. I'm sitting with Anselm Douglas, singer, songwriter, author, Grammy Award winner, and the song we just heard, "Who Let the Dogs Out," was the song that brought him. The Grammy and brought Trinidad, the Grammy and brought Canada, the Grammy and brought us in the Caribbean region, the Grammy. I'm owning and the, some and of the it. Bahamen, and the Bahamen. <laughs> okay, and the Bahamen. Yes, 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 yes. You know, but the first part of what we saw was some images, a slideshow of your authorship. Right. Right? Your authorship. Mm -hmm. uh, you wrote your first children's book in 2019 yeah. and it's called spin and scratch the adventures of spin and scratch adventures of, of spin and scratch what, what what was your inspiration to write this book um my mom uh what happened is my mom was in new york and you know you come up to new york and you're heading back to trinidad you know, you come up to New York and you're going back to Trinidad. So I say, I left from Toronto. I drove down from Toronto to see her before she went back down. And um, she's packing up to go. And I'm saying, hey, don't take none of these New York mics down to Trinidad. You know? <laughs> Jokingly. And a light came on in my head. And I, I, this might sound really, really weird, but the whole book was written in that split second. Mm. The, the whole not, uh, not I'm sorry, not the whole the, the whole storyline. Yeah. Was boom in my head. I was like, whoa. So now I'm talking to my mom, and half of my brain is working on this book, and the other half is talking to her and laughing and having fun. But there's this part of my brain that's it's working on this book in my head. And you know, when I left, I I started to write, you know. Put pen on paper. This is this is years ago, right? This is years. Mm -hmm. I started writing it, and then I stopped. And it, it, about I how got many to, years ago? This is about, I would think, uh, twenty twelve around that time. Wow. Around twenty twelve, I started to write, and it was like, okay, I'm, I'm getting this. I'm getting this. And then I just stopped. I really just stopped. Mm -hmm. I got to about nine or twelve pages, and that was the end of the story. It was a really short story, almost essay-like, you know. Um, but while I was writing it, I was I, there was this vision in my head. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. So I sent that to my sister, and I don't know if she ever got a chance to read it. And last year before, that would be 2018, we talking on the phone, and she said that thing you started to write about the, the mice going to Trinidad and all of that. Whatever became of that story, I said, who is there? She said, I just go through some papers here and I saw what you sent me. And I read it and I thought, that's a really good story. You should finish it. And as she said that, I just jumped back into writing mode. Mm -hmm. You know, and I started to write, I started to write, I started to write. And I sent it off to um, uh, a woman who became my friend and my business manager. And she said, she took it to the company and the company said, um, it's too long to be a picture book, but it's too short to be a chapter book. So we could cut it up and turn it into a picture book, you know, the one-liners for kids. And I was okay. like, no, 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 no. They said, well, you have to go back to the drawing board and open this thing up, which I did. So I went back to the drawing board and when I was done, we ended up with 17 chapters. So what are you hoping, what is the purpose of the book? Well, the book is really to, if, if you read the book, you realize that it's a kind of reverse migration. 
because people usually leave the Caribbean and come to North America. Mm -hmm. Here we have two American mice because of circumstances having to move from New York to yeah. the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. when she's, when my mom said that, the idea that came to my head was, you know, and this woman who came to North America and worked for years and years and she's going back home. And, and because of the fact she's going home now, she's telling her friend and neighbor that she's going home and the mother mouse overheard that conversation. Now the woman who's going home doesn't know that she has mice in her house. So the mother mouse heard that and told her two sons, Spin and Scratch, listen, Auntie Ruby is moving back to Trinidad. So I got to find some way to feed you guys. So she came up with this brilliant idea to hide them in the toe portion of one of Auntie Ruby's shoes. And lo and behold, these two American mice end up in Trinidad. So, so uh, how relatable is that story slash book to, mm -hmm. for any child? How relatable well, is it? Because of the elements that's in the story. The, the elements of friendship, okay, camaraderie, um, betrayal, forgiveness, love, um, kindness, you know, this all, all these elements that create this wonderful adventure of people in a strange country. And now you have the opportunity of learning a little bit about a tropical island. Yeah. That, and, and, and a lot of kids only dream about. <laughs> <laughs> what I love about the book too, it's a good Caribbean author's book also. Yeah, for for um, parents to to expose their children mm -hmm. to some of the lingo, you know yeah. that yeah. Uh, that is used in in Trinidad. Yeah. You know, I read the book and I remember thinking as I'm reading it, oh, this is okay. They say this in Trinidad, but this is what we say here in Ghana. You well, know, right. oh, this yeah. one, oh, we say <laughs> that too, too, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I mm -hmm. think it's a good uh, it's a good way also to sensitize children to their Caribbean heritage. I really do right. think that there's that place. So where can folks get that book to buy? Um, it's online and it's, it's in three different, uh, three different formats. Okay. You can get it as a uh, audio book. You can get it as an ebook. Just download it onto your Kindle or to your portable device, or you could just purchase it as a regular book and have it shipped to you. So you can get it on Amazon. It's on Barnes and Nobles. Um, you can get it from authorhouse.com. Um, that's a publishers, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah, so those are those are the main places that you can, you can get this book. Okay, um, and when all else fails, just Google it. The Adventures of, of Spin it. and Scratch by Anselm Douglas. So you have just finished a sequel to the book, although it's unpublished, and yes. it's called Cat's Catastrophe. Yes, it's something the, like that. It's such it, a tongue twister. Well, you, know the word, you know the word catastrophe, right? Yeah. The catastrophe. So yeah. we played on the word instead of saying a catastrophe, we said mm -hmm. the adventures of spin and scratch, the cat catastrophe. Catastrophe. Because we yeah. introduce, I introduce a, 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 a character called Tantan. Tantan is a big house cat. Okay. And he, and he don't play, he's a vicious hunter. <laughs> so don't tell us don't tell us i have to read it when it comes out when do you think you'll publish i don't want to I, honestly i don't want to put out a part two until people are really 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 familiar with the part one part one okay you know, and the good thing about books is like you know people still read moby dick oh yeah you know books books don't get old so i am i am working on this and and honestly my dream is to see this book become a full-length animated film. Nice. Quietly. Fingers right? crossed. Yep, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed so right? we, we're getting down to the wire here, and I have a couple of quick questions for you. How do you compare songwriting to writing a book? Huh. It's, 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 it's writing. It's like, you know, driving a car and driving a, a, an SUV. <laughs> you know? Okay. What is just bigger than what? Yeah, but let me let me stick up in here. Yes, it's writing. Mm -hmm. But and I did say but. Yeah. Because you've been writing for children so far. Mm -hmm. Writing is writing, yes, but you have to think about content differently mm -hmm. because your audience yeah. is different. That is so true. So. That is so true. Now so you have to you have to put your mind into the mind of a person that age that you're writing for. Just like right. when you put your mind into the party, go the fat person, what are they looking for when they go to fat? Now you've got to put your mind as to what would keep a child's interest. Children love animals. They love yeah. 
things like that, you know. So I know you got to see it from from where they are, you know. You know, you, you ever you ever look at a child and, and a, a child crawling in the house and say, "Where did you get this from?" Because where they are on the floor, they see things that you cannot see. So you might be looking for something for the longest while, and you'd see a child go to put it in their mouth and say, "Hey, give me that! Where you got that from?" Yeah. If you go down to their level, you'd see life from their level. If you okay. kneel on the floor and get down to their height, you would see a whole different world. A world that you were at at a point where you forgot. Yeah. Because you were at that level one time. And a so lot of people, like, hmm? and a lot of people are not in tune with that. That when you're talking to children, you want to get down to their level so that you get can down to their the level so they understand yeah. what you're saying and where you're coming from, yeah. and you would understand what they are trying to tell you. Yeah. So and the eye, to eye contact too. You know, yeah. the eye to eye contact too, just coming up to contact, their level. Yeah. yeah. So you're not only Build looking up now; you're looking at the same level. Yeah. And building character for them. Yeah. 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 So. It's, so it is. I want uh, in in like two sentences. Mm -hmm. How is the pandemic impacting your work? Um, at first I was okay and I was doing a lot of writing and then I'm getting to the point here now where I need to breathe, you know? Uh, and I, I know that has become a phrase, um, I can't breathe, but I, I need to breathe. I need to, you know, I'm inside here. I am with, 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 with my, my, my music book and and... and I'm writing some, but not as much as I should because I, you need to breathe. You need to get out and do something, but, you know, safety first. Yeah. Safety first, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Well, I think you can still go out and breathe, but... Just, just breathe sure alone. Take, make sure you take precautions as you go out there and you breathe, you know, be very breathe deliberate. Alone, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> be deliberate about how you do it. What parting words do you have for, for our guests today as we wrap okay. this up? So... For the international guests, I would love, I would really love for us to be a little more aware of the other person. You know, um, the Bible says, love one another, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You know, just be a little more aware of the other person and their feelings and what they're going through. We're all going through hard times and hard stuff in our lives. It mightn't be the same thing, but be aware of the other person and be a little more compassionate. About, about another human being, you know, that's, that's internationally. For people in North America, right here now in the US of A, election is coming up and all I can tell you is do your, your, your duty and vote. I am not an American citizen, so I can't vote, but I know the importance of sticking your finger as we said in the Caribbean, sticking your finger in that ink. In the ink, you know, yes. Me, yes. There's a check mark, there's check marks, but, yep, yep. Yep. So go ahead and vote and, and, and do your do your right, do your civil duty. Go ahead and vote. Yeah. So you heard it from Anselm Douglas, the guest on today for on arts, culture, and things in between. So for more information about you, Anselm, where can they go? Okay, if you just go onto Google and punch in anselmmusic.com, what you will see is a picture of me and all the icons for Facebook, Twitter, uh, Spotify, Instagram, everything is right there. So you just click on the icon, I will take you to that page. It makes it very easy. Good. Thank uh, you. That's anslimmusic.com. So, Anslim Douglas, singer, songwriter, author, thank you very much for coming and chatting with me this afternoon. I truly appreciate the time, the energy, the, the information, the knowledge, the everything that made it. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Talking <laughs> I enjoyed it a little um what you call it pelvic what you call it uh, pelvic movement pelvic movement pelvic. Everything was good. <laughs> and as i say thanks to my guest anson douglas i would like to say thank you to the viewers who joined us today and to those of you who didn't get a chance to join us now and will be joining later on viewing it later on thank you too for coming through because i know that time is um of the essence for most of us and there are other things that are pressing but some of you do get back and you watch the recorded version i have to acknowledge some very important people in my life claire ron goring who does the the flyer every week marcia gordon who takes care of the youtube channel and was on last week talking openly about her journey as a breast cancer so uh, a breast cancer thriver 
as we celebrate or, or as we observe rather um, breast awareness um, for this month. Yasuna Ryan, who is working on the website, Dr. Raul Manzano, who is responsible for painting the logo for the website. I thank you. These are individuals who've been giving unselfishly and the man of the hour, I say this all the time and I know that he cringes, the man behind all of this, the man, Raul, the silver of RDE pros. Raul, my brother, thank you again. Thank you so much for doing this. I can't thank you enough. I appreciate you. And again, to all of you who've uh, continued to support arts, culture, and things in between by coming by, appreciate you, appreciate you. Please like, share, look for the YouTube uh, page and, and share it. And I ask you to, I'm supposed to ask you to subscribe to, I keep forgetting to say that, like and subscribe. So we look forward to you joining us next week, Sunday at three to five. And again, to you, Anslem, thank you very much, thank you very much for, for doing this. God and bless. we will chat. I'm your God host, Rose October, saying a great week ahead. That's my wish for you. A productive week ahead. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye for now.